Thank you. Netta, take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Rayanne. And hello, everybody. So excited to be here with you today. And thank you for your interest in Catholic Relief Services and specifically the International Development Fellows Program. Um, if you feel like it, please put your camera on. It's always easier to be presenting and talking if I can see your faces. Um, and I hope that this will be a bit of a discussion, although there's a lot of information to share. So I will preface that you'll probably hear me speaking quite a bit during the session today. I'm really happy to have Samir with me. Samir is a recent fellow and he'll be sharing his experience as well during the call and then also helping to answer hopefully the many different questions that you may have. So um, just to tell you a little bit about myself so you know who you're with today, CRS is a large organization, about 8,000 people. Um, and I am joining you from Dakar. I'm in the CRS office in Senegal today. Um, I spent most of my time with CRS in West Africa actually started as a fellow here in Dakar 15 years ago, which I still kind of blows my mind that that was 15 years ago already. Um, but since then, I had um, a real nice journey with CRS. After my fellowship, I worked in Sudan as water sanitation and shelter program manager for West Darfur. And from there, I moved on to Liberia and worked in livelihoods programming um, that was mostly on an emergency response for Ivorians who had um, fled to Liberia. And after that, I worked in Burkina Faso for about five years on one of our large education programs. Um, after that, I joined our global people resources team where I've been managing a few of our different talent pipeline programs, as we call them. The most well known is the International Development Fellows Program, which I'll speak about today. Um, and it's, it's really my pleasure to be here with you. So um, I'll let Samir introduce himself when we get to a um, little bit further along in the session. But what I have planned for you today is to spend maybe just 10 minutes or so on what I like to call CRS 101, just talking about who we are, where we work, and how we work. And then we'll move into looking specifically at the International Development Fellows Program. I'll tell you a little bit about the structure, what we focus on, where you might be placed. Um, then we'll get to have a break from me and hear from Samir on his experience. And then I'll come back at the in the second part to tell you more about the application process, the requirements for the program. Um, and we'll have plenty of time to answer any questions that you have. So um, as we get started, I would love it if you could put in the chat if you've had any experience with CRS already, um, if you know anything about our work or you've had a chance to volunteer with CRS or you know, come across our teams in the field, for example, um, or if they're just um, any experience you have with CRS, please share in the chat and it'll be a little bit helpful and maybe you'll be able to jump in and, and contribute something as well during the session. So while you're sharing, and I'm keeping an eye on the chat, um, while you're sharing, I am going to get started. And the first thing, just maybe also kind of um, to get a sense of how much you know about CRS, if anyone would like to hazard a guess, how many countries do you think CRS is working in? Or if you know if CRS is working, how many countries CRS works in, please put it in the chat. We'll just, again, trying to kind of gauge your level of knowledge about the organization as we get started. And thank you so much for this lovely share in the chat. We have someone here who has, um, knows a lot of alumni um, who joined CRS through the program. Absolutely. We do have lots coming from many OPSIA schools, including Hopkins program at SICE. That's wonderful. One of my best friends at CRS came through that program, actually. Oh, good. And I see others who have encountered CRS through their Peace Corps work. Great. Oh, another Senegal connection. Love it. Very good. All right. And any thoughts about kind of CRS size and global scope before I reveal <laughs> what it looks like? All right. Well, here we go. So just to give you a sense of 
CRS um, scope and scale. We are working in more than 120 countries around the world. We have around 210 million people served last year, and we work with around 1,800 partners worldwide. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our partners and how we work in just a moment. Um, but just to give you a sense kind of of the global footprint of CRS to start us off. So CRS's mission is here if you'd like to read it in detail, but essentially we're focused on serving vulnerable populations overseas. Um, that is kind of the core of our mission and CRS works, as I mentioned, in many countries around the world. Um, we don't implement programs in the US. Our reason for being is really to serve individuals overseas. Um, how we do this is, um, you know, our programs take many different shapes and forms, and I'll talk about the main sectors that we work in in just a moment. Um, but CRS was founded by the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference, and we are part of the Catholic Church. So you will see those, some of these um, principles around Catholic social teaching that you'll see in our work and sort of guiding the way that we work. They're here on the screen if you want to have a look. Um, most of them are pretty straightforward, and there are different ways in which you'll see these in our work. We do serve everyone regardless of race, nationality, religion, creed, etc. Um, and um, and these principles really are very universal, and these are these are what guide sort of the way that we approach the work. I'll give you one example if you're looking at it and you're like, oh, how does that translate to something tangible? Um, let me give the example of subsidiarity. So this principle just means that the people or the person who is closest to the issue should really lead the decision around how they respond to that issue um, and what that response would look like. So we, what this means for CRS is that we always implement through local partners. Um, wherever we can find a local partner to take the lead, we would work with that partner. You may see CRS doing more sort of direct intervention. That's usually kind of at an early onset of an emergency before local partners have been identified. But working through partners is really the heart of our approach. And it leads back to this important principle of who we are and the way that we feel development is best served and most sustainable. So um, now let's talk about what kind of work we do. So again, if anybody wants to try to see or if anyone wants to come off of mute, but would you like to share, you know, what do you think are the biggest sectors or what do you know of CRS as sort of the biggest sectors in which we work? Feel free to come off mute or put some ideas in the chat. Great, health, education, wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Yes, heard a lot about ag's livelihood, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of work in malaria response and prevention. Absolutely, yes, you guys are hitting on some really big ones. Um, so here they are. These are kind of our primary sectors. And um, what you'll see is that in most country programs, we have really a full package of programming that will touch on multiple sectors and many programs that will be multi-sectoral programs where you'll have a health component in education. Um, for example, the last program that I managed in Burkina Faso, I said was a large education program, but it also had a health and nutrition component for the students. It had a wash component. It had a microfinance component for parents, um, you know, et cetera. So so most of our programs are really large and integrate many sectors. Here is um, an adorable picture of donkeys. And also, this gives you kind of, if you want to see the numbers, this gives you a little bit of a sense of this, that scale of, you know, kind of where CRS is working or in which sector CRS is working. So health, as you many of you guessed, um, is the kind of the biggest sector, but a, a lot of different programming falls under health programming. So like our very large malaria responses fall under um, that, for example. Uh, but then as you'll see, you know, there's many, many other sectors that 
that CRS works in, and there are others that that are not on, are not on this slide. But this is just to give you kind of um, a, a sense of those main areas in which CRS is working today. These numbers are from our 2023 annual report. Okay, and um, then the next thing I wanted to just touch on in the CRS sort of 101 sector is why do people work for CRS? So um, we have, as I said, a very large um, global team. About 85% of that global team is from the countries in which we're serving. Um, so the CRS staff come from all different backgrounds, religious traditions, non-religious traditions, and um, we really come together around our guiding principles and our common mission about serving the most vulnerable. So why do people choose CRS? Why do we stay? I think if you talk to people, you'll hear a lot of kind of themes in the reasons why they love working for CRS. Of course, you know, the work is so meaningful. That kind of goes without saying. Um, it can be a bit of a double-edged sword sometimes because, you know, it's so important what we're doing that you might really find yourself working a lot. So we have to be careful of kind of finding that space for ourselves and maintaining our own well-being because we're so driven um, to kind of provide the best programming as we can for our program participants. Um, but it can be exciting work. Um, it can be very, it's very varied work, you know, depending where you are and things are constantly changing. Um, so for those of you who really like to be constantly adapting to new situations, this is going to be your line of work. Um, our global team is amazing. I think some of my best friends are CRS colleagues from different countries. We really tend to farm strong relationships um, and really feed off of each other's motivation for the work. We are known for being a learning organization. Uh, the Fellows Program is a great example of this, where we offer this 12-month program that's focused on learning and preparing for onward roles. But of course, most of our global team do not come to CRS through the fellows program. And we have a wide range of opportunities that are available for staff. Um, we have a lot of more traditional learning opportunities through courses with leading content providers or funding for additional certifications or degrees. Um, but we also do a lot of practical hands-on training, um, which is what I'll talk about during the fellowship. But for regular um, staff as well who are not coming in through the fellows program, we do a lot of practical training as well. Um, as a learning organization, we're also very open to learning from failure and what doesn't go well. Um, if we had time, I'd share some examples of my biggest failures in program management. Um, but um, what you know, what's important in that is just that you know we all make mistakes, and as an organization, we seek to learn from that. And it, it is important an important environment that we foster in this field. Um, and then many career opportunities with CRS. A lot of people um, move from region to region or from sector to sector. It's pretty common. I, I kind of outlined a little bit my trajectory with CRS in working in different regions and different kinds of programming. That is pretty um, common for fellows. Um, they do tend to move around from sector to sector and region to region over time as you're identifying kind of your next career move, you know, or thinking about changing family circumstances and things like that. So let me pause here for questions is sort of before I get into the fellowship specifically, um, I'm, if anyone has questions about CRS sort of in general, um, feel free to share. Netta, I'm, I'm waiting to see if somebody asks the obvious question because I get it all the time. Um, and I'll ask because I have a feeling we have some shy folks on the line here. Uh, do you need to be Catholic or is it an advantage to be Catholic to work for CRS or to apply for this fellowship? Yeah, thank you for asking. So no, you absolutely don't need to be Catholic to apply for the fellowship or for any other position within CRS. Um, we, we don't ask or consider religion in any of our hiring processes. So that would not be known. Um, 
People used to say that like our senior, senior leadership had to be Catholic, but I would say that is not the case. If you look around the world today, like the country representatives in most of our countries, you know, a lot of them are not Catholic um, and they're still serving as the representative of CRS in that country. So, so no, um, the being from a Catholic background will not be an advantage um, nor would it really be considered within your career at CRS. Thank you for that great question. Yes. I imagine they some had that, yeah. Ray, Rayanne, let me know if I'm missing anything. I see, um, I don't see any questions yet, but please let me know if, if, if I miss it. But let me keep going because we have a lot of fun things to cover and, um, and, and then please, you know, feel free to drop questions in the chat anytime. So um, now let's talk about the fellowship specifically. And um, I just want to start with kind of outlining a little bit about what it looks like. So what is our program structure and our learning approach? So I mentioned it's a 12 month program. Um, fun fact, actually some fellows don't spend 12 months in the program. You can spend 12 months, um, but we allow fellows to start applying to onward positions after now eight months in the program. So um, we, the last four months now is dedicated time where the fellow can start applying to other roles and start transitioning. So if a fellow has a new offer within CRS after 10 months, then they may wrap up the program and move on at that time. Um, but we do offer for full 12 months and, and fellows can take advantage of that if they like. Um, we have been running this program now for several decades. Um, I think it started around the 80s. It's really changed a lot. I would say now when we have, um, we, you know, we have a learning design that's kind of tried and true, and we really focus on just hands-on learning experience. So what does that mean? Um, I'm gonna just go here so you can see these are the, the four learning areas that we focus on within the fellowship. So we have project design, project management, meal, which is monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning, and operations. So these are the four areas in which fellows must gain experience and we have um, sort of a, a list that guides what kind of experience we want them to get in each of these areas. So for example, within project management, we want fellows to be involved in project startup, implementation, and closeout. So they'll probably work on three different projects so that they can be part of the, that part of the project cycle. And our approach is that the fellow would be actively contributing to the work that's going on as they're learning about that, um, that competency, so to speak. So for example, if um, we're looking at project design, we have, um, we have many tools and resources that guide how CRS does project design, but the fellow wouldn't be sort of sitting alone looking at that document. Instead, they would be part of a design workshop with our partners. They would be doing a stakeholder analysis, a problem analysis. You know, they would be really working on all pieces of the project design, and it's in that way that they would be learning and moving through their fellowship objectives. So it, it really is all hands-on work. Um, all of the fellows are paired with a strong supervisor. In a lot of cases, the supervisor of the fellow is a former fellow themselves, or it's someone who has supervised fellows in the past. So the fellows do have kind of a unique training program. So we, we look carefully at who will be the supervisor to make sure that the fellow can get that full holistic learning experience. It is required that all fellows get experience in all four of the areas. So you can't kind of skip one or specialize in just one. Um, it's required that fellows work in all four. And that is really because the goal of this program is to prepare fellows for onward positions with CRS. And we know uh, kind of, we have a good idea of what kind of position that will look like. And I'll show you a list of those positions in a minute. Um, but we've found that um, really being prepared in these four areas is important for the fellow to then move into a variety of onward roles with CRS and to be able to excel in those onward roles. 
Um, the fellowship, we just a couple of notes on fellowship placement. So we place each fellow in a different country. Um, we don't put fellows in the same. So you'll be one fellow, you know, per country. And um, the countries that host, they change a little bit each year. Um, that's because we don't put fellows in high security settings. So sometimes a location will change, the context will change, and we can't put fellows there. Um, or we have to move somebody partway through. That happens sometimes. Um, but essentially, we, we don't do any high security settings. So you can be accompanied if you have a spouse or children that can accompany you during the fellowship. Um, and, um, yeah, and so what do we look for in the fellowship placement? So I mentioned strong supervisor. We're also looking for countries that have a wide portfolio of programs and a lot of different things going on so that you can get through those ambitious learning objectives that we have for the program. Um, when you apply to the program, you would apply just to the fellowship in general. So there will be no location attached to it on your application. And um, you don't really have the opportunity to, to tell us which country you want to go to. However, there are a couple things that will influence your placement. So the biggest one is language. Um, some countries require French or Arabic or want, you know, basically fluency in Spanish, for example. So um, we won't place fellows in those countries unless they have those language skills already. So that may influence your placement. Um, the other thing is if you're traveling, you know, with family, then, you know, that may change a little bit as well, the placement that we look at for you. Um, but essentially, you know, all of our placements will provide that comprehensive learning experience and that's our number one priority for you. Um, okay, and what else do we provide for the fellowship? Um, fellows are regular salaried employees. That means you, know, you have your regular annual salary and you also have benefits and allowances. So benefits are things like health insurance, retirement, things like that. And then allowances are things like cost of living allowance or rest and relaxation, depending on your post. So um, I won't really get into the details of those things, but essentially as regular CRS international assignees, you have all of the benefits and allowances that go along with that. Um, oh, leave is here on the slide, you can see. So we do have, um, I think, a pretty generous leave plan um, that includes vacation days, sick days, holidays, personal leave, et cetera. And then for fellows, we provide furnished housing in your location. This is usually a house or an apartment not too far from the CRS office. Um, CRS will cover the kind of basic utilities and functioning of your house. Um, and CRS will also provide your transportation to the location, get your visas if needed, et cetera, um, for you to be able to work there. Okay. Okay. And then here you have um, a, this is a, just a list of all of, sorry, I'm not sure if you're seeing the top of it, but um, this list here is just all the positions, example positions that fellows moved into right after the fellowship. So um, we, as you can see, you know, meal is a big area. A lot of times we'll have fellows move into meal, project design and proposal development, which we call business development. Um, that's another area where a lot of fellows will go after the program is over. We also have a lot of fellows that move into emergency response. And then we have many who will gravitate towards specific sectors. So let's say you know, you're a health person, then you might look for a health related program to manage after the fellowship. Um, so this is just a little bit of example. As you can see, what are the kinds of areas where fellows have gone? This is directly after the fellowship. And then in kind of the variety of countries they might go to around the world. 
this is just the first role. So after that, you know, we'll see fellows kind of moving on and progressing in their career with CRS. Um, most fellows tend to go sort of on a more general track where they move into positions like head of programming and other leadership roles in the country program. Um, but some fellows will go a little bit more technical and may join our more technical teams working in specific sectors. Um, today, as I mentioned, the fellows program has been around for a long time. Today, we have a lot of former fellows who are in leadership positions at CRS, and we just have a lot of uh, former fellows who are all around the world with CRS. So it's a nice network to be part of. Um, you'll certainly encounter them during your fellowship and after, and former fellows are kind of always excited to share advice and um, hear about your journey and give you some, you know, career ideas as well. So um, the fellows network work, I think, is a, is a really nice thing that we have at CRS. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Samir and let him tell you a bit about his fellowship with CRS and um, what he's been doing post-fellowship. Samir, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Neda. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Samir, and I'm uh, from Nepal. I'm currently a business development specialist with CRS in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I was a fellow in the 2022-2023 cohort, which was pretty recent. Um, but I was in, so I was in your position uh, not too long ago. I applied to the fellowship uh, during my second year of grad school at Columbia SIPA. Um, I was really happy to, you know, just get through the uh, extensive selection process. Um, like Neda said, we couldn't really choose in terms of, you know, where we were placed, but I had expressed my interest in being in West Africa because of my French speaking uh, capabilities and also my interest in uh, being part of a country program that had a mix of development, humanitarian programming. So uh, being placed eventually in Niger was uh, kind of a great opportunity for me because it kind of had a mix of everything I was looking for at the time. Um, so yeah, after a few months of uh, learning about my placement, I moved to Niger, to the capital, Niamey, where I was based for a year with occasional, occasional travel to, to different field offices. Um, so in terms of kind of, you know, summarizing my fellowship experience, I wanted to kind of uh, basically use the four learning areas as a way to structure and share um, some of the more specific things I did within those areas. Um, and then we'd be happy to, ha happy to answer any specific questions uh, later on as well. But uh, in starting with uh, business development, project design and, and development, um, you know, this was uh, one of the first things I got involved uh, in, especially uh, through being able to uh, support the business development specialist that was in this uh, country program already to uh, develop a concept note for a uh, internally funded uh, learning focused uh, pilot project. Um, you know, Netta mentioned that, you know, of course we get uh, donor funding for a lot of our projects um, within the agency, but there are also uh, many other projects that are funded by CRS itself that are really focused on maybe trying different approaches or, um, you know, focused on learning to then guide uh, future methodologies and project design. So for me, that was just a good opportunity to, um, kind of get that initial experience with uh, some of the processes and tools and approaches that we uh, use in uh, kind of typical business development uh, for uh, typical business development opportunities. Um, after that, uh, I was also able to support uh, a more in-depth kind of proposal development for a uh, project on social cohesion, livelihoods, and socioeconomic infrastructure with two local partners. And that was especially interesting because I didn't come in right uh, in the middle of the project design phase, but was also involved in all of the things that had to happen before. So gathering intelligence on this new donor that was um, you know, going to be launching this call for applications pretty soon within the country. Um, just kind of uh, being part of initial partnership discussions and just seeing how uh, the country program leadership, you know, just went about thinking, you know, which partners to work with and how uh, that will, how we would be able to kind of, you know, describe that in our proposal um, and, yeah, kind of continuing on from there. So 
Um, yeah, on the BD side, it was uh, probably the area that I was most involved in and probably makes sense why I'm in, in that role right now. Um, but yeah, that was, that was kind of the first part of the fellowship experience. Uh, the second, which corresponds to the kind of pictures on your screen, was more related to the project management side of things. Um, again, I was really interested in being in Niger because I knew that uh, a large portion of our um, programming was in the uh, emergency response uh, space in uh, two or three specific parts of the country. So um, even though I couldn't travel to the specific areas that we're implementing because of security, uh, security kind of uh, reasons, I was able to go uh, in the picture on your left, I was able to go to our uh, sub office in one of our emergency response zones and um, you know meet with colleagues uh, who uh, until then I had just been you know communicating via teams and calls and videos so it was just a good opportunity to get a better understanding of what uh, this sort of implementation actually looks like in practice and contribute to some of the review and planning phases of uh, multiple projects that were uh, taking place in this and other zones um, the picture on the right was for a uh, kind of HQ led marketing and communications um, team that wanted to go to some of our areas that were implementing uh, malaria prevention activities to uh, monitor, you know, what we were doing in these areas specifically with um, government stakeholders, with field agents, and of course with uh, vulnerable community members themselves. Um, this particular field visit was focused on uh, how we were supporting digitalization for uh, some of these seasonal malaria chemo prevention campaigns um, with bed nets, with anti-malaria uh, medication. So uh, it was, again, just interesting to see uh, what actually we were doing on the ground. All right. right. Um, also, the PO that we put in. Sorry, I think someone's off mute. Okay. Um, and yeah, just to, just to close off on, on this particular experience uh, with this Global Fund programming, uh, ironically, after I, I returned to the capital, I myself got malaria and that was my first time. Um, but yeah, I think going through that experience just helped me, you know, better, even better understand and better appreciate the work that, uh, you know, we were doing um, with different communities and um, yeah, just how difficult it is, um, you know, when, when you get it yourself. Uh, moving on to meal, uh, for me uh, here, this was mostly meal related to uh, project startup and project implementation. So for the initial um, internally funded project that I'd mentioned, once we received that funding, I was part of the team that uh, supported the startup processes, which included kind of developing detailed implementation and budget plans. Uh, you know, what were the main meal activities we needed to do during uh, at the beginning of the project, during and after the project, um, and you know uh, how we are going to work with our partners to to truly kind of measure uh, what we are doing and how we are learning from it, and how we would be able to use that for uh, future programming as well. Um, uh, here, I think uh, what was really helpful was um, again being able to work directly with you know, colleagues who are based both in the capital and. Uh, in the uh, field uh, who are collecting, you know, this information uh, on a daily basis and kind of just better understanding, again, what so sorts of tools and methods and approaches that um, CRS uses to uh, kind of, you know, monitor and uh, evaluate our, our programming. And lastly, in terms of management quality um, and operations, uh, I uh, really got the chance to get a better understanding of what our colleagues in procurement and human resources and security and finance did in terms of their day to day, but also in terms of, um, you know, how they were supporting particular projects. Um, I think that was important because, uh, you know, whether right now in my BD position or in the future, um, I don't think that I will be playing kind of a direct operational role, but um, in whatever programming uh, role that I am in, I think it's really important to have the understanding of what operational colleagues uh, are doing and how that uh, coincides with um, you know, different types of uh, programming and BD and meal and kind of all the other aspects uh, that fall under the programming uh, life cycle. 
Um, in terms of kind of broader reflections, I think for me, the best part of the experience was just getting the chance to uh, live and work in a new context and to really learn from experienced colleagues. So in that sense, every day was genuinely uh, a great learning experience. Um, I, I didn't mention this, but I also was able to spend three months in neighboring Mali as a acting uh, program quality manager on a temporary duty assignment as part of the fellowship. So that was, you know, just another experience under my belt um, during that year. Uh, as Neta mentioned, uh, for me, having a strong relationship with my supervisor was very important uh, during the fellowship itself, but uh, also after the fellowship in terms of finding that uh, onward position and, uh, you know, continuing that professional relationship even after I had left the country program. Um, I hope that I'm being able to express that uh, what this fellowship can provide is a really strong kind of uh, introduction to key aspects of humanitarian and development uh, INGO's work and to give uh, fellows a key set of uh, base skills that can be used for many, many uh, future roles. Um, and that includes, you know, having a strong network both within and outside CRS that uh, even in my short, uh, relatively short experience with the agency, I've been able to really uh, leverage and um, really learn from and appreciate. Um, of course, there were challenges of the experience, uh, not only in terms of the context, uh, I mentioned by getting malaria. Um, at the end of my fellowship, there was a military coup in Niger and I had to be evacuated through CRS support. So, you know, of course, contextual challenges like that, but um, of course, with the work itself, like you're supporting many different colleagues on many different tasks. So there will be periods uh, where you have a really high level of involvement and you really have to, like Nana mentioned, like manage your time and manage your um, mental health and, and all of those things. But there are also uh, other times where you have an opportunity to focus on, um, you know, really things that you want to learn and pursue uh, uh, for, for your own kind of professional growth as well. Uh, and to conclude, um, as, as I mentioned, now I'm a business development specialist in uh, the DRC. I'm based in Kinshasa. I'm still really tapping into my experiences uh, in Niger, uh, both around BD, but also program quality and operations. Um, and overall, kind of looking back, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to, to go through this type of um, kind of training and onboarding because it just, again, has given me the skills to be able to do uh, my job today uh, at, a, at a high level and, and to be able to work with um, colleagues who have you know, decades of experience in, in this particular context. So uh, I'll stop there. I hope that was um, an interesting kind of um, yeah, reflection for you and I would be happy to, happy, uh, happy to answer any questions in the Q&A section. Thank you and over to you, Nada. Samir, thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, I mean, moving on to be business development specialist in one of our biggest programs in DRC, I think definitely says a lot um, about what you were able to, the skills you were able to build during your fellowship. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate that you mentioned some of the challenges and the realities of the fellowship, like malaria, as I'm like swatting away mosquitoes over here. <laughs> and also, um, yeah, the evacuation, things like that, unfortunately, you know, happens more often than we would think it would. Um, but that's, of course, the nature of our work. Thanks for also mentioning the temporary duty assignment, um, because that is another nice part of the fellowship. And most fellows do do that. Uh, we have a lot of requests for fellows around the agency. So fellows usually get to choose towards the second part of their fellowship to go and spend you know, six to eight weeks, maybe more like in Samir's example, in another country supporting on another activity. Um, so that is also, it isn't only for fellows, that's something we do with CRS staff in general, but fellows usually get to take advantage of that during their time, their first year. So Samir, thank you so much for sharing. That's wonderful. And I, I'm, I'm guessing they will have some questions for you in the Q&A.
I see there's two questions in the chat that I'll just quickly touch upon before we move forward. Um, the first one is asking if fellows are placed in thematic areas of concentration within their country program, meaning do they work within emergency health, et cetera, and is that based on their background and experience? So um, essentially, no, we don't match fellows with country programs based on the fellows previous experience in a certain sector or the programming happening in a specific country. The reason for that is because we want fellows to focus their skill building on those four core areas, the project management, meal, et cetera. And um, we, we, we don't want fellows to get sort of siloed into just working on health and kind of just being you know focused on one sector so essentially as fellows are working through those four different skill areas they tend to bounce around and work on different kinds of projects so you heard with samir talking about social cohesion projects and others that's that's what it will look like. So um, you'll work on you might work on a health project when you're doing some meal activities, and then you might move over to an ag project to work on you know some project management things, right? So um, you won't you won't be focused on a specific technical area, but you will certainly get. Um, more familiar with those large areas where CRS works because you will see those sectors present in almost all of our country programs. Um, sometimes fellows will have a choice if let's say there's a similar activity happening on a health project and on an ag project, they could say, oh, I really want to learn more about health. So could I do the activity on that project, which, which they, you know, that's definitely fine and doable, um, but we don't factor your interest in a specific sector into the placement process. Um, and then the second question was, does CRS provide funding for local language training? This um, essentially, no, this is not a focus area for CRS. Um, in terms of staff development. Where CRS does invest in language training is for languages that are spoken more in multiple countries like French, Spanish, for example. Um, but, um, but you won't see training offered in local languages with a few exceptions. There are some countries like Madagascar, for example, where the fellow really needs a little basic Malagasy to speak with the partners and things like that. So they will do a small investment in local language training, but it's it's really at the discretion of each country and to the extent that it's needed. So I would not, um, I would not at all want you to think that's part of the fellowship. Local language training is really not at all a focus um, for the fellowship or for CRS. Um, but certainly something fellows may do more just kind of on their own, right? As you tend to be eager to get to know your community and, and things like that. Um, yes, and then the last one here is the program geared towards postgraduate or can it be pursued concurrently in grad school in DC. So um, that's a great segue into this next section on the requirements for the program. Um, but we do require that your graduate degree be complete by the time that you begin the program. Um, you will be working full-time overseas, like a full-time staff. So um, you do need to have your graduate de degree completed. There are staff who will pursue other advanced degrees while they're with CRS, and you could do that, but you do need to have a graduate degree to meet the qualifications of the program. And um, I'm going to mention a little bit about timing too, which is important. So if you are, our application just opened yesterday, we do one annual um, application a year, and it will be closing on November 1st. So um, that this application that's open right now, this is for the class that will begin next year in August. It's a, it's a long timeline between application and program start. So if you are in your second year of your graduate program, if you're in a master degree program, you would want to apply now. And that way, you know, you'll graduate in May, for example, and then you would begin the program in August. So please keep that in mind in terms of time frame. But yes, your graduate degree would would need to be um, 
in hand by the time the program begins. So here's um, just a quick snapshot of the the requirements for the program. I want to just bring your attention to two of them. Um, if anybody had been to a info session in the past, you might notice like, oh, something here is different. And what's different now is that we require two years of work experience and six months of that experience must be um, gained in a developing country setting. This two years, it's two years overall, six months is just part of that. And um, this can be work experience, volunteer experience, um, you know, it can be any really any kind of experience, um, but that six months does need to be in a developing country. So we don't want this to be your first time to work in those contexts. We wanna know that you've already done it, you know what you're getting into, and you're excited about being in that environment. And then the second thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the language. There's a set, there is a requirement to have proficiency in a second language besides English. And this can be any other language in the world. So um, you will tell us what is the language that um, you're proficient in. And as part of our selection process, we will test your proficiency in that language, but we can accommodate nearly all languages. Um, they will all count. Um, we, you will see here, we have a slight preference for languages like French and Arabic. That's because we need those languages for many of the countries in which we work. So um, if you speak one of those languages, it may give you a slight advantage, but I really don't want anyone to be discouraged because it's really rare that the decision in who we hire would come down to which second language you have. So, you know, it's, it may be a slight advantage, but it's really, you know, negligible. Um, also, can we do need candidates who are willing to work anywhere in the world because, as you know now, you don't get to choose your fellowship location. And um, also very important is that individuals of all nationalities can be eligible for the fellowship. You do not need to have work authorization in the U.S. You won't be working in the U.S. We will be getting you work authorization for the country that you are assigned to work in. <clears throat> Um, yes, and then here's another great question. So um, what percentage of fellows sign on for longer roles with CRS beyond the fellowship? So each year we hire usually around 12 fellows and um, we look at this number carefully because our goal is to retain these fellows and we don't wanna bring on so many that we won't have enough roles for them to move into at the end of the fellowship. But at the end of the fellowship, essentially fellows will be given the green light to go ahead and start applying in that last four months of the program. And um, they will compete for any opening that they see within CRS. Um, our experience is that most fellows who wish to stay with CRS are successful in finding an onward role. Usually it's, you know, of the 12, usually there's usually there's one or two who will decide either, you know, for personal or life reasons to maybe relocate back to their home country or to go to another organization. Um, but the vast majority of the group, you know, upwards of 80% every year will decide to continue with CRS and they will be successful in finding onward roles. It's not always like very quick and easy. It is a process. Probably one of the most challenging parts is moving into the onward role because, you know, you don't know which roles are going to be open at that time. You may have to push yourself outside your comfort zone and apply to things you didn't really envision for yourself. Um, but most fellows are successful in doing that. Um, there is this, there is no requirement in terms of how long ago you, um, you got your degree in which you would be eligible for the program. So um, you can have finished your degree five years ago, 10 years ago, you can apply. Um, we don't have any criteria around when you graduated. We have, I'd say on general fellows have around on average, it's about three years of experience, work experience. So, and some fellows have much more. They, some worked for five, six years and then went and got their graduate degree and then joined the program. So um, it really varies and we don't have any um, criteria around that. 
So um, just quickly looking at the application and selection process, I mentioned the application went online yesterday, so you can see it, access it now. Um, we also have a, a specific cover letter that we ask fellows to respond to. It's a specific prompt, rather, not a cover letter, but a specific prompt we ask you to respond to. Um, so please, please do that. Essentially, um, that is very important in the review process and, um, and applications who that are more just generic in nature do not usually advance past the initial phase. So please take a moment to visit the website. You'll see the prompt for the cover letter. You'll see more information on what we're looking for in the cover letter and length, things like that. So please have a look at that. And that really is probably the biggest piece of work around the application. After you do the cover letter, you just submit your resume and the online application is very fast. It's you know just a few questions that are mostly yes or no, just sort of verifying that you have the two years experience, that you speak another language, things like that. Um, and then you would have completed the online application. The next step now is a video interview. This is actually a pre-recorded video interview. So it's like a one-way interview where you will see me um, asking a question and then you'll get a couple minutes to respond. I see Samir smiling. Maybe it's like good memories, bad memories. Glad you're not doing it again. Um, it's probably a little bit awkward because you don't have a person to really interface with, but um, that's the next step is that video interview. It's just a few questions. This should be pretty fast. Um, after that, the candidates that move on from that stage will be invited to a language assessment. That, as I mentioned, would be in the language of your um, choice language you told us um, that you'd like to be assessed in. We'll, we'll organize that. It's just a 20 minute um, oral assessment. Um, we may or may not do a phone screen in there at some point. I leave it in there in case we decide to add it to the process. Um, but the, and then the final step is a virtual interview. The virtual interview will do a few different things to get to know you better during that interview, and you'll interact with a lot of different CRS staff during that time as well. And then I mentioned kind of this long timeline. So here it is just for your reference, but essentially, um, as the applications start coming in and it closes in November, from November to January, um, we'll move you through the different parts of that process. So if you'll move into the video interview, the language assessment, and then by February, we'll be at the interview stage. Um, then really quickly after the interview stage, we extend offers. And then over the summer, we do a medical clearance process to make sure that um, you know, it's okay for you to get access to the services and things that you need in your post um, of assignment. And we get your visa, your flights, all of that worked out over the summer. And then in August, we begin. So let me stop there. And it, and I mentioned the website a few times, but here it is, the link to the website. Um, and um, that's where like, you know, a lot of what, what I've been sharing around the application process is there available for you. So um, we have just under five minutes. I wish I had a little more time, but I'd love to hear if there's any other questions. Okay, I think I see one in the chat. Oops. Let me scroll up so I can see the whole thing. Okay, so with the six month experience in developing country, could I elaborate? Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, I um, I used to have a, so essentially what we're looking for there, as I said, is we're kind of trying to make sure that people um, understand the context of living and working in a developing country. So individuals um, who are from a developing country automatically meet that requirement. So, so that um, you, know, you wouldn't need to have had work experience there. However, you will still need to have the two years work experience overall. So you will have had to, you know, had some work experience maybe in another country. Let's say you worked while you were in grad school in the US and you're from Kenya, for example, then you would meet the requirement in that way. Um, so I hope that that helps to answer the question. Yeah, and then, okay, so the next one, 
yes, internships. So the next one is elaborate more on what the two years of experience would look like. Would internships count? Yes, absolutely. So internships, volunteer experience, um, even like living and studying or doing like research in another country um, or just anywhere for the two years of experience, all of that would count. We're, we're pretty open to, you know, the experience in terms of what that looks like. We're really trying to find things that are relevant to the work that you would be doing as a fellow or with CRS, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be. Yes. Thank you for this next question. It can be really in any field. That's absolutely fine. Are there any other last minute questions? I, I had one if there aren't any other questions. Um, what is the difference between the fellowship and an entry level position? I mean, you you talked a lot about the devel developmental um, and mentoring and training opportunities. Is that the biggest difference? And if somebody is really interested in doing this work, should they be looking at the fellowship and entry level positions with CRS? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's a great question. So I think what's so unique about the fellowship is that you have this whole year to really dive into different areas versus most entry level positions with CRS are going to be really focused on one specific job. So, you know, if it's like a, a meal position, you're really only going to do that. You won't have the opportunity to work on project management, business development, and get a feel for if there's something else you want to do. And you'd also need to come into that entry-level position with more experience in that area, whereas the fellowship will kind of take more general experience and we're looking a little bit more at like how flexible you are, how adaptable, how willing you are to work and serve in different areas. Um, the fellowship, of course, has no location attached, but all the other entry level positions will. So if you know you're really drawn to a specific region or a technical area, then I would say and you want to be just in that area, then I'd say go for those other entry level roles, because with the fellowship, we really can't guarantee that it would kind of, you know, meet your um, what you're looking for in that area. Um, also, the you know, the fellowship, we we get a lot of applications and it's a, it's a wonderful program. And I think in some ways it's more competitive than other entry level roles. So if you aren't successful in applying to the fellowship, absolutely put your name in for other positions. I think you definitely, you know, want to cast a wide net. And if you feel strongly about CRS, then, you know, please try other avenues as well. That takes us to time. I want to thank you, Netta and Samir, both of you so much for sharing your experiences with us and telling us all about the program. If folks have questions as they're going through their application, is there are there resources on your website or what's the best way to get their questions answered? Yeah, absolutely. So there, there is a large FAQ section on the webpage. So please start there. Um, there's an email box. I'm not sure if my whole screen is showing. It's on the top. It's idfp at crs.org. Okay, so they can um, they can also email there if there's something that's not answered on the website. Um, I'm the only one that mans that box, so it might take a while to get a response, but I will try to get to you. So you can email me there. Um, and then on our website, you'll see that there are other info sessions that are happening for like general public. So you can also feel free to join another call. You may say me and maybe somebody else, um, and we would do our best to answer your questions that way as well. Thank you both. And I would encourage all of our participants to also check in with your career centers to get help on your application. Um, that's what we do. Uh, thank you all for joining and um, and uh, hope you do apply. Thank you so much. I hope so too. And wishing you all the best, regardless of which organization you go to next. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having us, Rayanne. Thank you. Take care. You too. Thanks, Samir.